So in yesterday's class, we were looking at one specific example of the use of logical effort, where we took up the problem of designing a decoder circuit and went ahead and you know did the calculations for that and found that without really needing to even choose the individual sizes of the gates for the transistors, it is possible to form an estimate for the best delay that you can get through this thing. Okay? So what I am going to do today is just sort of summarize that once again, draw it in the context of a general chain of logic and sort of just briefly go over how the principles of logical effort can be used in order to estimate the delay that the best delay that you can get. Okay? So as an example, let's consider that we have some chain of logic that looks like this. Let's say I start with an AND gate. It goes through to an inverter. Now, apart from this inverter, there are actually multiple copies of the inverter here, let's say, two copies. Okay. There is an OR gate over here. In the same way, there is multiple copies of the NOR gate also attached. It need not even be always the NOR gate, it could be anything, any logic out there. Okay? And finally, we are interested in some load capacitance and our constraint is on the input side our capacitance cannot be greater than some given quantity. Okay? Where is that given from? Essentially the way that we are looking at this is this is a black box. design this box subject to a load constraint and an input size constraint. Okay, both of these are given to you by the system architect, the person who is actually doing the overall system level design. Right? So you need to be able to drive a load of such and such quantity, so many femtofarads or so many picofarads. At the same time, you cannot present more than such a large load to your input, to whoever is driving it. Okay, under those conditions, you need to essentially be able to derive what is the best set of gate size. The problem itself is, choose the gate size. for minimal end to end delay. So it's a very specific problem that we are trying to solve over here. We are trying to minimize the delay. I am not interested in minimizing the area, I am not interested in minimizing the power, the cost, anything else that you might think about. Logical effort purely talks about the delay. Okay. There are some other extensions of this which talk about how you can apply the similar concepts in the context of area or power and so on. But the basic idea of logical effort applies to the core concept of delay. Okay. So now, putting this in the context of the circuit that we had yesterday, what we had was we wanted to design a four input NAND gate or AND gate. Right? with an 8-way branch inside. Going back to this circuit, each of these points, this is a branch. So it's this. Okay? What we mean by a branch is there is one particular path that we are interested in. What is the path that we are interested in? It is, I just 
So that path that is highlighted in red is the path that you are interested in. Okay? So in other words, what we are saying is every path has a certain delay associated with it. Every path through a circuit. I start at some point, go through logic gate, end at some point. I have a certain delay associated with the path that I have followed. Okay? Now, what we are interested in over here is to find the delay of that part. But what we are saying is when we try to do this, there are certain branches. Right? They are not on our path. Because after all, I am not interested in finding the delay to this point. Right? To any of these examples. I am not finding the interest in finding the delay up to these points. Right? What I am interested in the delay up to here. But at the same time, the other points also are clearly, and whenever the NAND gate, for example, delivers some current, some of it goes to that inverter which is on the path, some of the current goes to the inverter which is off the path. So clearly, the fact that there is an inverter off path will affect the total delay of the circuit. Okay? So every time that there is a branch, that in turn affects my overall end to end delay. So, overall, if I was to write out the delay through the entire circuit, it's going to be given by some of the individual delays through each gate, which in turn, I know that for each individual gate, its delay is given by its logical effort into its electrical effort plus its parasitic effort, right? This will derive independently of any paths or any other thing. Right? Over here, VI and TI are great constants. Right? So, there is nothing I can do about them. As soon as I have chosen what kind of gate I have, the GI is fixed, the PI is fixed. It is a property only of the type of gate, not of its size or any, any other factor related to the circuit. What about the HI? That directly depends on the circuit. In general, the HI is given by the load capacitance at I divided by drive capacitance at I. What do I mean by drive capacitance? The self capacitance of that gate. Okay? Now, this is also easy to understand. For example, if I have an inverter like this, driving an AND gate, then there is, this is the load capacitance and the capacitance of this is drive capacitance. Okay, that's easy to understand. What happens if my circuit looks like this? Now, what is the drive capacitance? Same, this value here, right? The capacitance of the inverter. What is the load capacitance? It is a sum of both. It is not only the NAND gate. Even though I might be interested only in the path through the NAND gate, the load capacitance here is the sum of both of these. Okay? So this is the C load of the NAND 
and the payload Jupiter inverter. This my circuit looks like this. Now what is the load capacitance? Right, three load is the three load and the load. Also, there is nothing else out there. If there was a branch, then it would be three load lines plus whatever else is there on that branch. But what is C drive? Is it the total capacitance at this point or is it the capacitance only due to the inverter? Only due to the inverter. Only the inverter is delivering current into the NAND case. Remember that. Right? So, what we are talking about is not the total capacitance at this point. It is the capacitance of the driving gate. So it is whatever is the C drive of the inverter alone. Nothing to do with the NAND, the, with the other NAND gate it is connected over there. Okay? Now, what is typically done in practice is Remember what is given to you in the circuit. Only the load constraint and the input size constraint. These two endpoints are given. Nothing about the sizes inside the circuit. Okay? So what we usually do is we define one term capital S, just like the smallest values of electrical effort that we were defining. as the final load divided by the initial state drive strength. So from one end to the other without worrying about what is there inside. Okay? The next thing that we say is any time that we have a branch of this sort We introduce a branching factor di is equal to C the capacitance on path that is on the path that we are interested plus the capacitance of path divided by the capacitance which is on path. In this case C load of the inverter plus C load of the NAND is divided by C drive of I. That is the state drive of the inverter, the first state inverter. Uh, sorry, it is C on path plus C on path by C on path as well. So it is C load of the NAND gate plus C load of the inverter divided by C load of the NAND gate. Okay? Why is it that we are doing this? Because once you have written it that way, I can take this branching factor, multiply it by what I define as the H factor over there, which is the C load of the NAND gate divided by C prime of the inverter. And get the total, or I call this X prime. The total X, the actual electrical effort, is going to be given by Ei into Hi prime. So it's going to be given by C load of the NAND gate plus C load of the inverter 
divided by the drive of the previous stage in work. Okay? This is something that we are used to normally calculating. This is what we would normally have done because as we did in these two examples, we just find out the actual effort that is being expended at this point, the electrical effort. Okay? What is the actual load divided by what is the drive strength? That gives me the electrical effort at this point. Multiplied by the logical effort of that particular gate gives me the contribution to the delay from that gate. Okay. Alright, so what are all the things that we have defined? For this path that we have here, we now have a set of gates. We have the final load constraint, we have the input size constraint, and we know what are all the internal branches that are happening. Okay. Based on this, what we are going to say is, in order to sort of simplify the calculation, I will straight away write down three terms. Capital G is the product of all the GIs on the path. Okay. Capital X is the final load constraint divided by the C prime of the initial stage. Just end to end without worrying about the individual sizes of gates inside. And I will define D as product of all the branching factors on the path. If there is no branch, that is, for example, the second case where there is no branch, then T on path plus 0 divided by T on path, so the branching factor there is 1. Okay. If there is a branch and there is some path which is not on the path itself, then it means that some of the current being delivered at that stage is getting diverted away from what I need. That is what this branching is taking into account. Okay? So we have these three terms and we define capital S as the product of these two. Okay? This is a constant for the path. So, our final problem now once again reduces to I need to take this summation and minimize it subject to This being a constant, right? Which is pretty much the same as product of H i is also a constant. Right? The H i is the unknown source here. The G i and T i is are known. The H i is are what are unknown. Okay? So effectively what I have is I need to Minimize this summation subject to the constraint that the product of all the is a constraint. Right? It's not exactly equal to the g into x into b, but it is related to the g into x into b. The fact that g into x into b is a constant means that the product of HI is also a constant over there. Correct? Di does not come. Di is anyway a constant for each and every one of the case. Right? You are already given the case. This means that the di, no, sorry, not the di. Uh, okay, my sorry, my mistake. Di does not come out. The h i is already taken into account the di. Remember how I define h i prime and di h i. So h i already takes into account the branch. Okay, if there is any branching at a the point, then the h i has already taken it into account.
ఓకే వన్స్ అగైన్ ఈ తో ఎస్ఐ ఆర్ కమ్ కెపాసిటెన్ ఆర్ టిఐ బై టిఐ మైనస్ వన్ గో త్రూ ద సేమ్ ప్రాసెస్ అట్ ఈవెంట్ ఎయర్ అండ్ ది ఎక్స్ విత్ రిజల్ట్ సార్ జీ వన్ ఎక్స్ వన్ మస్ బి ఈక్వల్ టు జీ టూ ఎక్స్ టూ మస్ బి ఈక్వల్ టు జీ త్రీ ఎక్స్ త్రీ for minimizing the end to end day right because what we have is g1 into c1 by c0 plus g2 into c2 by c1 plus etc we differentiate with respect to c1 and we get g1 by c0 must be equal to g2 into c2 by c1 square so actually g1 into C1 by C0 must be equal to G2 into C2 by C1. Okay? G1 S1 must be equal to G2 S2 must be equal to G3 S3 and so on. Okay? So, what is the telling us as far as this original part is concerned? We are given a part, we are given the end to end load capacitances. We are, we know what is the amount of branching that is happening internally. we also know the type of gates that are there so we know all the gl so we know capital g we know the amount of branching so we know capital d we know the end to end capacitance so we know capital s so capital s is equal to g into b into x we know okay the product of gi s is equal to g into b into x So the last one, they are just those individual terms that have been taken into account, right? The product of the GI is the logical effort. The product of DI is this capital D. And the product of all the SIs will give you the end-to-end load capacitance ratio. Okay? So subject to that, what we have is, we want to make g1 s1 equal to g2 s2 equal to g3 s3 okay all of this is equal to the capital s to the power of 1 by n that is g into b into s to the power of 1 by n. Okay? Once you have that, the overall delay, I'll call this small s, and the overall delay is equal to n into s plus summation of the pi value. In the case of inverters, all the pi is equal to 1, so it was again just plus n. If the gates are not inverters, then each one has its own individual parasitic delay. You have to take that into account while doing the summation. Okay? So, once again, in the context of yesterday's problem, four input J, okay? One possible way of implementing this is to say man for L on. Right? What is the capital G over here? It's the product of the GI. It is just the There is only one gate, so there is no product. It is the GI of the 4 input 90. Which is how much? 2. Branching factor always remains the same. Because we know how the system is constructed. There is an address input. 
which goes into eight such states and from there it goes into individual decoder line. There is no further branching which happens after that. So the branching factor for this particular circuit is already there. The X was only the end to end load capacity without taking branching into account. So it was minus 6 divided by 10. Okay. So S is equal to V into V into X. In this case, small s is also equal to capital S because there is only one case. So the total delay is going to be given by small s plus the parasitic. Okay. V into V into X is how much? This I think is approximately 135 or so. Some error on that. Okay. So the D, the delay is going to be equal to 135 plus the parasitic delay of a 4 input 9k. Which was what we calculated yesterday was it is 3. Remember, of course, this is in units of 3 hours. Right? The actual delay is to get it in picoseconds, you need to multiply it by 3 hours. Okay? What if I have changed the circuit slightly and made it man 4 followed by inverter? to make it an AND case. Now, once again S is equal to G into B into S. This is the only thing. The logical effort becomes 2 into 1, which is the same as 2. The number doesn't change. Into 8, into 9.6. So it remains the same, 137. But small s, is equal to capital S to the power of 1 by 2 because there are two states. I am able to equally divide this. This is going to be around 11.5 or Right? Because 11 square is 121, 12 square is 144, so somewhere in between, around 11.5. Delay is going to be given by 2 into S plus sum of the parasitic delay is equal to 23 plus 3 plus 1. So this is equal to 27. Right? What was the previous case? It was 138. By just adding one extra inverter over there, I have made it much smaller, 27. Okay? Now the interesting thing is, I can add one more inverter. In normal logic, you would never do this because two inverters, one after the other, cancel out each other's effect. Right? So why would you ever take a signal, put it through two inverters and again change it to something else? It makes no sense because logically you have not changed anything. Okay? But the important point over here is, it makes a difference from the point of view of delay. What kind of difference does it make? F remains the same as before. Small s becomes capital S to the power of 1 by 3 instead of 1 by 2. This is approximately 5.1 also. Right? Delay is going to be given by 3 into s plus sigma pi is going to be given by 15.3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 20.3. Okay? If I add one more over there, 9 4 followed by 3 inverters, 
I will get a different number for the total delay. Right? It may be possible to reduce the delay, it may be possible to slightly increase the delay. The important point is I am doing all these calculations without ever having to go through the design of the individual case. I know that because the delays of the case are related in this fashion, the optimal way of getting minimum delay is to balance out that G into X parameter across each and every one of the case. How much should the total by product of G into X be? It should be the G into X into B across the entire path. Okay? So from here, what if I had a slightly different choice of logic? Let's say I do land 2 gate followed by an inverter, so that is A dot B the whole bar, again bar, C dot B the whole bar, again bar, okay. This is sufficient, this is, well, I need to combine them again, so how do I do it? I put it through another land and an inverter. Okay. Now, something changes, it becomes G is equal to 4 by 3 into 4 by 3, not 2 into 2, no sorry not 2, because for an AND 4 it was 2, for an AND 2 it is 4 by 3, so 4 by 3 into 4 by 3 is what it is. Okay, B remains the same, H remains the same. So S is equal to, I think I made a mistake, 135 was 4 by 3 into 4 by 3 into 8 into 9.6. Okay, let's say around 130 or so, it doesn't matter, right, it's somewhere close to that day, because 16 by 9 is also close to this. But it is less, and that's the important point, okay. Smallest in this case is this 130 to the power of 1 by 4. Right? This is approximately around 3.2 or there. So, what is the total delay? 4 into S plus summation of Ti. 4 into 3.2 is 12.8 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1. So, that's 6. 18.8. Okay. So, any combination of such gates that you want to try out without having to choose the individual sizes of the gate, you can form an estimate of what the end to end delay is. Okay. Now, just one minor modification to this. What if I don't choose all the FIs to be equal? That is the small FI. Right? I must still choose the FI, or rather, by definition, the FIs are such that whatever values or sizes you choose, the final product, the product of FI, this will be equal to capital S. This is by definition. There is nothing you can do about it. Okay? So, supposing you choose the values 2 and 2 and 3 and then whatever is there for the last case, right? Then the delay becomes summation of Fi plus Ti. That's all. Instead of n into s, it becomes summation of fi. The summation of pi term remains exactly the same. Right? So, if you choose fi such that the cases are not all equally balanced, you will still get the value for the t. You can still get an estimate for the t. You only need to know what is the choice of fi that you have made at each case. <laughs> Okay. All right. So with this, I'm going to stop the treatment of logical effort. Please go over this and think about it. It 
it is a very useful way of doing computation, right? It is not the only topic of interest as far as this course is concerned, of course, but it is one of the more important and more intuitively interesting ways of approaching a problem. Okay? Keep in mind the whole purpose of design, any kind of design, not just digital circuit design, is that there is no single solution to a given problem, right? Like you can see over here, there are so many different implementations of a four input IMS case, many of which also have delays that are very close to each other. How do you decide which one is the best? Most of the time there is no single answer to that. Okay? So the whole purpose of design is to be able to say, okay, these are my different choices. If I make this choice, these are the benefits, these are the drawbacks. If I make this other choice, these are the benefits, these are the drawbacks. Which one is better? Maybe both are equally acceptable to me. In which case, I'll just pick any one. But otherwise, if there is something, let's say that the power is more or the area is consumed is more for one of the choices and I don't want to accept that increase in area, that makes it easy for me to decide, okay, there are two options, one of them has a larger area, so I'll pick the other one instead, the one which has a smaller area. Okay? All of design is fundamentally built around this idea of trade-off. You are always trading off something for something else. If one cost goes up, something else will usually go down. Okay? And the purpose of or rather the core idea of design is how do you balance those costs. In general, there is no unique answer. The final answer depends to a large extent on the user's, the designer's experience. Right? But if you are not experienced, if you are not an experienced designer, the one thing you can do is use these kind of rules to sort of help you to get approximate estimates. Once you have got an estimate using the idea of logical efforts, you can then decide to go into one of those designs in great detail, do the complete design down to the transistor level, do a spike simulation, do a layout, and finally find out whether it performs the way that you expect. Right? What this is telling you is, for example, straight away the circuit involved in a single NAND gate is a bad idea, don't do it at all. NAND gate followed by one inverter is also not good enough. Two NAND tools with two inverters is probably better than one NAND core followed by two inverters. Right? Once you have all of that information, you can then make the choice. Which one do you actually want to take? Okay? Alright, so with that I am stopping the subject of logical effort. We are still going to remain on the topic of delay. Right? One topic that I am going to consider in a little bit more detail now is what happens to the parasitic delay for complicated gate? Right? What do we mean by complicated gate? Not inverter, something more complex like a NAND gate or NOR gate or AND or inverse, something complicated of that sort. Okay. So what's the trouble here? Let's consider a two input NAND gate. Now, what we said was, the total capacitance, the parasitic capacitance at this point the size of the gates were like this, okay. The parasitic capacitance at the output node is given by 2T plus 2T plus 2T total of 60. Okay? And as a result of this, what we said is, it doesn't matter whether it's rising or falling, this is the total capacitance at that particular node. Right? And we can form an estimate of the rising delay as well as the falling delay, actually approximately the same, based on this. 
the problem is rising and falling the circles that are seen are not exactly the same okay what is the biggest difference this node over here also has a capacitance associated with it okay how much will be the capacitance at this point now it's not entirely clear what it should be because after all there is one source one drain right you could say 2t from that source 2t from the drain so a total of 4t but usually what happens is the way that you do the layout you will combine the two together you will combine the source and the drain diffusions into one diffusion area okay so effectively what happens is on a junction like this the total capacitance is 2t itself approximately okay in reality of course it depends on your layout once again this 2t is just the approximation for hand calculation it doesn't matter right whatever it is there is some capacitance there i am going to take it to be approximately 2t for okay what happens what is the effect of this capacitance will it cause things to speed up slow down Slow down. Why? Under what condition? Rising, falling. Will it affect the rising delay? What happens during the rising condition? We have some current which is coming through the film or going into the external load capacitor. Okay, and the voltage here is rising. what that usually means especially if the a transistor is off right the a and mos if it is off what that would mean is all the current that is coming in from there is going directly into the c parasitic at the load if the a transistor is on it is slightly more tricky to create right because what we are saying is some current might even flow in here into this and cause the potential at that node the internal node we will call it to increase okay but that's not a secondary condition it happens only when a is on that is the a and mos is on and the output is rising okay output falling is a different story for output falling always you must have whatever is the capacitance on c parasitic that has to get discharged and there will be some charge stored on the internal capacitance at x that also has to get discharged okay the circuit will become something like this This is just connected to ground, right? For this charge, okay. What about rising? something of this sort can happen in the worst case for writing okay so the question that comes to us is does this matter we know what a single first order rc charges or discharges is we know that there is a time constant j 
So you question something one minute before minus three by RC, that RC is the time constant and that RC itself gives us an estimate of how much is the delay through that RC circuit. But now this is something a bit more complex. I have two R's, two C's. Okay? Each of the C's is seeing a different amount of period resistance from the source which is trying to charge or discharge. What impact does that have on the final delay through the circuit? Okay? So this is one example of a place where the fact that there are other capacitances can complicate your delay calculation slightly. There are other examples, for example, when you have a clock tree, right? You have a clock which is trying to be, which you are trying to distribute across a large part of the circuit. You will once again have a similar situation where there are lots of resistors and capacitors forming a tree kind of a structure. Okay? How do you estimate the delay through the circuit in such situations? Is there any straightforward way of computing the delay for a more complex network like this? And how does it apply in the context of these kind of circuits? Okay? We'll take that up in the next class. So, by the way, uh, on Friday what we'll have is instead of a regular class, we'll be having a tutorial session. I have uploaded a second set of tutorials on the Moodle website. Okay, please make sure you go through those as well. The reason for that is obviously the quiz is coming up next week. So, this set of tutorials will also help you to sort of prepare for the quiz. Okay? Use Friday's class to work with the TA to get all your doubts cleared. I will also be present over here. So, you can get all your doubts cleared at that point. Okay? Make sure that you go through both the tutorials, 1 and 2, before the quiz. Because they will be important for the quiz. The quiz is as per institute schedule, okay, so on September 2nd.